Yeah. Um, I'm interested in what um, kind of thinking is starting to happen for the fall enrollment period, whether some of these kinds of things you did are, uh, whether there's been or might be some uptake by the state of using these kinds of methods, and also whether you two are planning for other kinds of technological um, uh, uh, things to build or to build on to your base that you maybe didn't have time to do yet for, for this one? Sorry, I'm just going to pizza. I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to answer for, yeah. this for, well? for the, the uptake by the state question? Um, we've yeah. shared with them what we've done. I don't know that they're interested. Um, <laughs> And it might be like they're, they've been running around like chickens with their heads cut off trying to make this happen. So I think now this is their moment of reflection. So maybe now they'll want to talk about it more. Um, our plans for the fall, I mean, we don't know if we're going to receive funding to continue this work for the next enrollment cycle. But if. So for, <laughs> as far as this technology stack, people want to use it. We have it. And we have off by now. So we will. We have like five campaigns with them, so one of them is going to be the at court, and I don't see why we wouldn't use this for the ACA in the fall. Can you talk about your civic marketplace that you talked about, like what the plans are? So the grants, so, let's see, uh, so we've actually hired a number of uh, companies to do things. Um, so let's see. So we hired like uh, Derek's company, DataMade, to build uh, like the Chicago Health Atlas and the Early Learning Portal. Um, we hired uh, Josh Kalov uh, and Kalov Strategies to, uh, in our partnership with Cook County, to actually open up their data. So the county had attempted to hire someone to do this, and they didn't have the budget to get someone who was really on the ball and qualified. So the Chicago Community Trust through Smart Chicago put a path, the county put a path, and we hired Josh. Um, we contracted out with a company called Local Data to help um, identify abandoned and vacant, vacant buildings in Chicago neighborhoods. Uh, we've contracted with Purple Binder to help research, um, to help gather information on social services. Uh, we've hired a company called Textizen to help the Department of Cultural Affairs get feedback on their public art plan. Um, we uh, hired uh, Free Geek Chicago to build a crime and punishment in Chicago site, which I can show you. And then uh, Smart Chicago has also hired me um, and my company to do consulting work, uh, research and writing for Smart Chicago and event management and some project management stuff. So part of Smart Chicago's goal is to sort of create a marketplace or to create, to show that there is a market for civic apps and civic technology companies so that we can be somebody's first customer and then they go off and get other customers and go, hey, look, this is what we built for Smart Chicago. What can we do for you? And then they get other clients and it grows and grows and grows. Um, I want Chicago to win. No offense to my friends from New York and Riley. Uh, but I want Chicago to win sort of the civic technology race, and this is part of how I think we're going to do that. Why did the city pay these firms to begin with? <laughs> because <laughs> not gave us the rent and not the city. Foundation money to pay a developer to develop a service for the Department of Cultural Affairs. Who's doing that deal with right <laughs> Because Smart Chicago applied for the grant and not the city. And the fact that too much snow removal. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying the city shouldn't be hiring people, but we got the grant. And we want, because we got the grant, we're determining which projects we want to do. The city isn't suggesting these projects. We actually um, partnered with, we actually outreached to DCASE because they were already talking to Texas at one point. And since we had already gotten the grants and we're talking to text and we're like, why do separate things? You just come over here and we've already got the account and everything well. How do you help those organizations scale to like other cities, right? That's kind of what I was getting at. It's like, if you want to make a marketplace, how do they sell to government? 
Yeah, yeah like, it's like doing, doing it. they created something for you right here in Chicago, which, you know, is one of the biggest challenges we see, right, is that there's so many good ideas and so many talented people creating so much great stuff, but they build it for a Chicago or a, Ra a Raleigh or a New York. And then what's the marketplace to take that same idea to New York, Chicago, L.A., et cetera, right? So how do you, how do you, what are you trying to do to kind of help help them fix that problem? Because I assume you see that same problem, right? So we we do. One of the things, so the one of the things that happened is a number of cities have actually contacted Smart Chicago and asked, you know, how did we how did we do it, and or have asked about replicating their model or replicating our model, and so you have that occurring, um, and then. Sort of the, even though we're the first customer, it's not necessarily, Smart Chicago cares about, you know, we care about everything and everybody, but we're primarily focused on the Chicago area. Mm -hmm. And so sort of we can't, there's not a whole lot, at least for the Civic Works project, that we could do directly to sort of influence the procurement policies of San Francisco. Yeah, so I guess I'm not talking about procurement. I'm just talking about like if, if somebody builds something for Chicago, right? How is well, that transportable to? Well, everything that we've done. In fact, I think the one's down here. So all the projects that we built are open source. Mm -hmm. So if you go to GitHub.com/slash/smartchicago, I think that's it. It's gonna be really embarrassing if we get this wrong. So all of the projects that um, we built are on the Smart Chicago Collaborative GitHub page. And so for this one, uh, so it's there. And so anybody can go in and fork our uh, repository. Um, so sort of we've already built part of it. And so if another city wants to use our repository, they're more than welcome to. Um, so that's part of it. Um, and I think Expunge.io, which uh, Kat, uh, Ding built, um, it's been forked by, what? no, no, I don't want to fork it. Uh, I know it's uh, Oakland has looked at uh, forking it because uh, they've got a network together. Um, so part of it is we're, we're wanting to do things open source and we're wanting to sort of show that people can make money doing this. Um, but, you know, people have got to, let's see how that looks. Um, but in terms of like helping people like get customers in other cities, that's not something that Smart Chicago does. Could you do that and license your software and sell it? And make money and keep well, the, business, the developers that built the software could do that, but not from Smart Chicago's point of view. Um, so if um, Josh wanted to sell the, repository, the license to the software, he's more welcome to do that. Um, but Or if Free Geek wanted to sell their software, that's Free Geek's decision. Uh, Smart Chicago is just providing the funding Available, to. Right? No, Smart Chicago does is all of the stuff that we built is open source and under an MIT license. So if you want to like claim ownership, it seems like the money should be paid to them to do it and resell it. We care about getting this we care more about getting the stuff done than sort of the licensing and making money from the license. And so when people sort of do a direct carbon copy of something we pay to get developed, that's perfectly fine by us. Is to step on that that you use uh, its open source license, and so if somebody takes it and uses it, do they have to uh, make their code available? So the only thing uh, we ask for is attribution, and so as long as they link back to us saying you know we're originally developed by Smart Chicago, then we're okay. Hey Christopher, just just FYI, a similar initiative. Uh, happening coming out of Nashville called the uh, Multi City Innovation Campaign. 
where the five cities have come together with Boston, my hometown Raleigh, um, where they're standardizing app development. Um, but what they're doing is they're getting government to agree on the platform or maybe an open data schema for the overall initial problem. And then they're teaming up on those requirements. It's very awesome. I'll, I'll send in a tweet to you and you can read it to the crowd here. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. So it's called the uh, multi-city innovation campaign. Um, and unfortunately, they're kind of down the path already. Submissions are working in place. But this is just the cool beginning. Once they can kind of prove the model, they're going to open up the floodgates. Okay. Have you seen any other uh, groups of cities working on uh, similar projects? This is groundbreaking. Uh, and this is being fueled by an NSF grant, very similar in the way that Christopher got uh, money to kind of jumpstart his program here. And the Knight Foundation's also, so this year they didn't award the community information grants. They made deep dives into Chicago and I believe the other city was uh, Detroit. And so next year we're going to be able to do more stuff like this on a bigger scale. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. This was great. Uh, say, uh, Chris, I wanted to ask uh, after uh, Free Geeks, I know them as a recycling uh, concern, but I've never heard of them doing software development. I was wondering how closely you work with them and what they were like. Actually, is Brian still here, or did he have to? Oh. So, um, we had initially gotten in touch with Free Geek during last year's National Data Civic Hacking. Um, we had a meager hat event at Blue 1647, and the Free Geek um, fielded a team called the Supreme Chi Town Coding Crew, where they were sort of David Eads, who works with the Chicago Tribune. Um, he was mentoring uh, some beginner coders. They entered it and they won, and so they popped up on our radar. And so when we um, we got in contact with, uh, I already did it up. We got in contact with the Chicago Justice Project about doing a project to sort of outline the entire spectrum of criminal justice data. And we really liked the way that they had done the Meager Hack project. And so we had contacted them and said, you know, do you want to essentially do for what you did for Meager Hack for us for money? And they said yes. And so we, um, sort of work via GitHub and through emails uh, over the course of about three months and uh, built the crime and punishment site. Yeah. So, so I guess in the same vein as other questions about the cities, um, how much of this is reliant on the fact that Chicago has like an open data platform? Um, and related to that, I guess are there are a lot of other cities that are like moving that direction. Because I feel like Chicago's own data is pretty unique in terms of how much stuff is available to, to people. Chicago actually has a lot. So I know New York has just a ton of data. Um, San Francisco is opening up more data. Philadelphia has a lot of data. Um, one of the things that Chicago is working on is getting their data hardwired to the internal systems so that whenever something happens like a pothole gets filled or they enter in a restaurant inspection, it automatically pops up on the portal so no one's having to enter it in. Um, and if you want to talk a little bit more about the, if you if you like the data portal. Uh, sure, uh, uh, well, we can what sense what did, what did uh, Oh, no, 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 wait, no, I'm not thinking. No, I'm just, I'm just curious, like, are there a lot of other cities that are like, so, so my question was originally that, like, does a lot, how much of this stuff is based on the fact that Chicago has a like, open, like, easy access? Well, how much of this project tonight but not much? Is that, is that your question? I, well, I think just, I think, I think it's a good question, right? Chicago has one of the best open data portals in, in the world, quite frankly, right? I mean, especially with the community of, of you, uh, we, we go to these events all over the world, and by far this is one of the, like, North Stars in the in the, the, the open data kind of hacking community. And um, so, I mean, the, the connection that, that you guys have been able to create with the city, I think is um, probably as good as we've seen. Um, so that's, you know, this is, Chicago is the North Star. There's no, there's no question about that. Chicago and New York, in, in my opinion. Um, this is, we work with about 100 cities, counties, states across the, across the 
mostly North America, but we have ones all over the world. We like open data is becoming kind of the de facto standard in government, right? So, you know, four years ago, I think when kind of Chicago started its foray into this, they were one of, you know, five to eight that were doing this. But we're starting to see it go down, you know, in population as well. So you're seeing smaller cities like, you know, Providence, Rhode Island, and, you know, Hartford, Connecticut, and Somerville, Massachusetts, and West Sacramento that, you know, 30,000 person type of cities doing this versus three to five million, you know, type of city. So um, I, I think you're right. A part of being able to do a lot of what we've talked about is, is around the ability to get at the data. And part of getting at the data is having uh, an open data portal in which the, the, the city is working at piping that to communities like you guys. Um, and, um, but we're seeing that really, um, that evolution happen um, across the world and also going down in population band as well. And, you know, it's our opinion that city, state, county, federal, um, this will be the de facto standard. Like open is the new standard. I mean, if you've seen some of the stuff that's happening with the, the Medicare data that's being open, you know, we're helping Medicare, you know, open that data. And, you know, for the first time, this is data that we believe will really change kind of the, again, the, what the standard is with, with health data, right? It's like, now that you've opened it, you can't really close it up. And their people are just going to want more because it's going to do a lot. Um, it, it's going to provide a lot of avenues in, in how people are looking at that data. And, and more than just the data, I think the thing that really drives a lot of these projects is not necessarily the technology. I mean, Bufu and Twilio are they're fantastic tools, but they're not the most fancy whiz bang technologies out there. What I think really drives the apps is the organizational relationships. So there's no amount of technology that can replace all the community organizing that LISC has done over the years. You, you can't do it. There's not going to be an app that replaces that. And so because the project worked, not necessarily because of the tools, but because LISC had organizers in the field and was connected with all of these organizations within the neighborhoods. And it was definitely a project where the technology is supporting the work of the community nonprofits uh, more than anything else. And that's um, what drives this project. That's what drove the Expunge.io. Uh, that's what's driving the project we're doing with the Southwest Organizing Project is not necessarily just the data side of it or the technology side of it, but definitely more the community organizing side of it. Another way to think about it is, does the particular project rely on open data? And this one we just heard is not, right? They were collecting their own data and then they were using the existing service. A lot of them do, and so I think that's why you see a correlation between like, um, you know, cities that do really sort of data tend to have more activity like this, but there's really every project that like, your companies should do even if there is no open data. From uh, your perspective, and so you see more uh, cities opening up and getting more data. Yep. You see also an increase in like data sanitation and data quality. I remember in the early days of data.gov that it was pretty messy and yep. you know, a lot of different varieties. Yeah, we, we work with data.gov as well. I, I think that varies, right? I mean, I think that comes down to um, skills in-house, um, where the data is coming from. I mean, a lot of things. I think it's getting better. I think we, there's a tremendous way to go. Uh, sustainability, like Chris, Christopher talked about, is a huge issue, right? If, if you if you open open data in January, and dump a bunch of data in there, and don't touch it till December, it does people some good. But what does people a lot of good is being able to build a three one one explorer that has data piped directly in out of the systems, and you know financial data and, and data that really allows citizens, you know, developers to build things that are relevant, right? Um, so I think it varies. I mean, one of the models that we're seeing, we work with a lot of, you know, companies like Derek's and, and, and others that, that are trying to figure out how to make a business out of these great ideas that they have and how to transport it from city to city. And one of the things that we've been able to help with a lot of these organizations with is that from a data portal standpoint, we've, we've become one of the standards in, in the marketplace. And so, you know, if, if, they, if they build an application against our API for San Francisco, they can pick that up and take it to you know Chicago or New York and say, hey, all you have to do is put in data with this schema and this and this API, and and now I can take my idea and go sell it to a bunch of cities versus having to kind of rebuild that for each city because 
you know it's going to be a different environment technology wise when you walk into that city so um we're working with a lot of developers to kind of help them transport their ideas and, and really make a business out of it. Is there uh, an easy feedback uh, mechanism to say, hey, this data exists, it's got most of what I want, but I just had this extra field. Now, sure. that's, that's what this event is, the, one of the main purposes of it, right? So we have people in the city. I, uh, other people like Tom Shank, uh, who's the um, uh, director of analytics for the city of Chicago, um, they're here. and. That's another point that I think needs to be made about why Chicago is in the state that it is. It's because people look at the data and they do stuff with the data. And yeah. funny things happen when you try to make an app with some data. There's things that you inevitably have questions about, right? Or, oh, this seems wrong. And there's a feedback loop that exists here that I'm sure exists in a lot of other cities. I know it exists here because I, I have conversations with people in the city all the time. I'm like, oh, look, this data is wrong or this data has some weird bug with it. Um, we, I mean, just tweet this guy and like they'll fix it. It's crazy, right? But they do. <laughs> yeah, that's that's very true. Yeah. Um, so the individual cities control. Uh, they they control the veracity of the uh, of the data. Um, because it's a, an open data platform, can a third party uh, also confirm uh, the reliability, the veracity of the data? Mean like reporters? Yeah, 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 they do all the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so this last week, right? There was an article on the Chicago, the Chicago magazine about uh, they took the city's crime data and they uh -huh. they did some analysis on it and they said, look, you guys are classifying things that there's a body, but this is, you're not classifying this as a homicide, right? And there's a whole uh, they did a lot of investigating and checking not just that one data source, but checking against a bunch of different places and doing some you know reporting, right? Uh, and they found, yeah, there are problems with data. Right? And that, that's the value of open data, right? It's like it's, right. They, basically once it's open and they can suck it out through API or download it to CSV or whatever, now it's up to them to like crunch it however they want, right? And everybody's going to look at that data with their own lens, right? We, we would look at it a certain way, you would look at it a certain way, and based on that, you roughly get you know the best opportunity to crowdsource better data, cleaner data, wrong data, um, because you're 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 outsourcing that to, to a larger 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 audience. Just to give you some reference, like in New York, we don't have that kind of data. We can't even have that conversation. Mm -hmm. So we gotta we gotta like we gotta foil it. We gotta like do open records requests and you know beg, borrow, and steal to get our hands on the, the simplest of crime data. You, you don't have we don't. It's not really. Like, Chicago is like unfortunately. I mean, there's yeah, a handful of us. Yeah, <laughs> Chicago like they released that data in 2011, and no one had no one had ever. These data of that granularity. It's like a six million row data sets, every crime reported since 2001. Latitude, longitude, type of crime, all that stuff. So it's, I mean, it was unprecedented. They brought down the data portal. There's so many downloads. <laughs> it brought down the data portal. Are there any questions, other questions? Can I, because I, uh, I want to get to the, I want to make sure we have some time at the hacking portion. Yes, of course. Yes. They just said that, you know, this would be a shorter presentation than the last time. Uh, were there any other questions? That anything? Cool. Uh, did you have